If a political career fails, does it make a sound? More importantly, does it bounce back or is it just a one-way ticket to obscurityville? And I'm grateful that today is not the end of our story. We'll keep fighting for America and we won't rest until America wins. What's going on crew? Welcome back to the channel. I'm so glad you were able to make it back. It was a long weekend and you know what? Your boy missed you. Hopefully you missed your boy too. Now I wanna try and paint a picture for you. Imagine there you are, the final round of Political Idol. All of the votes are in. The crowd gets <gasps> Our star has fallen. And from the back of the room, you hear a voice that shouts, change teams and try again. Is it a new strategy or a political version of, have you tried turning it on and off again and see if it works that way? Now I'm gonna get into my top five takeaways about Nikki Haley's South Carolina primary loss last night. But before we do, I wanna just say this. Crew, you already know what to do. But if this is your first time here, I'm gonna ask if you could be ever so kind as to drop a token in the tip cup by hitting that like button because your support fuels the journey. And I am grateful for every supporter that I have. Now let's go ahead and get into takeaway number one, Haley's comment, the great fizzle. Now I want you to imagine the biggest, most hyped up show and then the main character vanishes faster than the last slice of pizza on Lizzo's cheat day. I mean, Haley came out swinging. She had TV ads galore, a bus shinier than a disco ball, and a war chest that would make Scrooge McDuck blink twice. I mean, all of that, and she still couldn't seal the deal. It was like watching an expectations limbo contest. I mean, how low can you go without hitting the ground? Iowa, <laughs> let's just call it a graceful third. New Hampshire, a robust 43%, but still no cigar. She danced around those numbers like a cat on a hot tin roof, but when push came to shove, those digits just would not get past the 40% mark. She stated, I am an accountant. I'm an accountant. But fortunately for you and I, this was a numbers game that she was not gonna win. Now Trump, on the other hand, this brother was sweeping the board. He left Haley clutching at those moderates and liberals like the last life raft on the Titanic. And yes, let's talk about that election night party. More like a gathering of tumbleweeds. With the music flipping from CNN to party tunes faster than you can say quick exit. So what do we all learn this past weekend, folks? Well, you know what? That's not fair. I, I, I shouldn't preface the question that way, right? I can at least tell you what I learned. When it comes to glitz and glamour and, and, and bus tours, there isn't enough of them in the world that can save you when the numbers come calling. Moving on to takeaway number two, the voters disregard for Trump's legal issues. Now, in the latest episode of American politics, The Wild Ride, Trump's legal and political dramas read like a, a, a plot twist on a primetime soap opera. Despite a corrupt New York judge hitting his brother with a $450 million fine, $83 million on a BS defamation case, and an additional $50 million in legal bills, Republican voters just shrug that shit off. And let me not forget to mention those shots that Donald Trump took at Nikki Haley and her husband because of their relationship. I mean, if you know, you know. That was supposedly supposed to have sparked like a whole bunch of outrage, but I, the truth of the matter is it barely put a dent in the support uh, of us veterans towards Donald Trump. And amidst the chaos, Haley's not so tiny group of supporters could spell trouble for Trump if he can't win them back by November. And all I have to say to that is uh, bullshit. So what did I learn from this takeaway? I learned that there's no amount of legal turmoil that can actually shake Donald Trump's base. And there is literally nothing the lamestream media or Nikki Haley's uh, supporters can do to convince us that we should vote for Hillary Light. And that takes me to takeaway number three. If you want to win the GOP primary, you better win over Republicans. Haley? <laughs> man, let me get myself together, man. <laughs> Haley trying to win the hearts of the Republicans is like trying to win the final rose on The Bachelor. But here's the twist. As it turns out, you actually need, you know, Republicans to win that rose. Who knew, right? So let's set the scene in New Hampshire where Haley's pulling numbers like the prom queen of the independents, pulling that smooth 43%. But among the GOP voters, she's like that chick that brought an accordion to a Metallica concert, snagging a mere 25% next to Trump 74. That's right. Two thirds of her fan base wouldn't know a Republican primary from a potato sack race. Flash back to Iowa and it's like deja vu all over again. Haley's dancing with the independents, but when it comes to doing a Republican tango, she can't quite catch the beat and got two left feet. And then if the saga needed any more spice, when it came to Nevada, she didn't just get beat. I mean, she got smoked. She got beat by none of these candidates. Talk about being a bridesmaid in a wedding of political relevance. So now we're back at her hometown in South Carolina and the early birds at the polling station are singing a very familiar tune. Trump's the bell of the ball with 60 plus percent and Haley, as hard as she's trying, just can't quite get the 40. I mean, sure, she's got the independence vibe into her tune, but in a crowd where seven out of 10 are dyed in wool Republicans, she's playing a really, really tough room. And just when you thought it couldn't get any more lonelier at the top, her hometown GOP establishment gave it a cold shoulder. <laughs> 
<laughs> cozying up the trunk like he's the guest of honor. It's like you're 12 years old watching your entire family cheer for the rival kid at the spelling bee. Okay, Crucial, let's talk about Super Tuesday. It's like the Olympics of the primary season. There's 15 states and a territory throwing their hats in the ring. This is where the big delegate bucks are won. But here's the twist. It is VIP only. That means no independents and no Democrat. And that spells a lot of trouble for Ms. Haley, who's been counting those outsiders like they're the last guest at the prom. And check out this genius play. In a bold move, a Haley linked nonprofit is already trying to win over Democrats and independents by spending millions of dollars on TV ads. As if to say, crash our party, pretty please? So, what did I learn from takeaway number three? Well, in a political soap opera, if you're aiming for the crown in the political primary, you might want to make sure that you actually, you know, appeal to Republicans. Otherwise, you're just serenading a crowd that's already waiting for the next act. And that leads me to takeaway number four Haley is not giving up on her stance that Trump can't win in a general election. <laughs> Haley is on her Mission Impossible tour across the states. Picture this, Haley zigzagging across the country faster than a pinball. Michigan, Minnesota, Colorado, Utah, then a whirlwind through Virginia, Washington, D.C., and North Carolina, and then Massachusetts. Makes you just dizzy thinking about it, right? And, and, and for what? The grand finale of her final argument? Hey, I might not win this thing, but Trump sure as heck can't beat Biden in the general election. <laughs> Seriously, this chick is delusional. Now cue the dramatic music as uh, Betsy Ankney, who's uh, uh, Haley's campaign manager, uh, tries to give us a message designed to pull at our heartstrings. The stakes. We know the odds, but we also know the stakes. We understand that this is about saving our country. We understand that Nikki Haley is the only one who can win a general election and finally get us back on track. Donald Trump lost in 2020. He lost in 2022. He lost us the House in 2018. Nikki Haley is the only one who can finally get us back on track. And so those are the stakes of this race, and that's what we're focused on. We know the odds, but we also know the stakes. Look here, uh, chick, at this point, Vegas wouldn't take that bet. Now, let's not forget Haley's media blitz, where she's literally been sharp as a tack. I mean, she's, like, she's hammering home on all of the main talking points. Electability, because um, uh, according to Haley, ever since Trump stepped on the political stage, Republicans have had a losing streak longer than the Cleveland Browns. She's painting a doomsday picture that a Trump-led ticket is going to cause more havoc than a bull in a china shop. And not just threatening the White House, we're talking the whole Congress shindig. I mean, let's count them off together. Iowa, uh, New Hampshire, uh, Nevada, and now South Carolina. They all said thanks, but no thanks to Miss Haley's presidential dreams. Uh, it's kind of hard to claim that your opponent is a loser when they keep collecting wins like their Pokemon cards. Haley's trying to sell us on the idea that she can lead the GOP to the promised land. So far, the only thing she's leading is a cross-country tour of America's finest airports. And that leads me to takeaway number five. All that's left is delegate math and money. All right, strap in because this political roller coaster is about to hit warp speed. And the twists and turns are going to be coming at you faster than your teenager's mood swings. All right, so we got Trump, our headliner in this political circus. He's racking up delegates like a kid in a candy store. But let's not take a victory lap just yet because, you know, he hasn't won yet. This, this is like a marathon. He's got a lot up against him right now. Now, the plot still thickens as we zoom in on some of the juiciest delegate stuff states on the map. And wouldn't you know it, California's up for grabs in March. And that's where Trump's team has been craftier than a fox in a hen house, setting up rules more favorable than a home game. And I'm here for it. Now, enter Nimarata Nikki Haley, waving her banner of democracy, insisting on something radical, letting people vote. Imagine that. Give them a real choice, not some Soviet-style lineup with just one name on the ballot. Nikki out here acting like she liked that, throwing shade like it's sunny in July. But hold the phone, because Trump squad out here crunching numbers like they back in high school algebra, claiming that even if Haley pulls a Houdini and scores 43% across the board, Trump is still set to bag the nomination by mid-March. Yet the grand finale of this primary saga hinges on one thing. Well, maybe a few. Moolah. Bread. Dough, scratch, dinero, bands. Despite Trump's deep pockets and treasure trove, Haley's war chest was bulging more in January, aiming to rock and roll all the way till Super Tuesday. So what have I learned from this episode of America's Next Top President? Money talks, democracy rocks, and in the world of politics, I guess it ain't over until the cash runs out. Popcorn anyone? Because this show is just getting started. Let me ask you a question. If your career is the long running TV series and politics to network, when can you tell it's time for a spinoff or if it's time for the final curtain call? If you enjoyed this content and you want to see more like it, make sure you smash that like button and please consider subscribing to the channel. I'm just going to thank you in advance for checking out my other videos. So until the next one, I'll catch you in the comments. I'm pumped.